So, uh, as, uh, as I said this morning, I'm Donatella Ponziani, heading the Downstream Gateway, and I have the pleasure to moderate this uh, session. He, together with me, uh, our distinguished speakers, uh, I start with Geraldine Naja, who is Acting Director of the Commercialization Industry and uh, Procurement Directorate in ESA. Uh, we have with us uh, um, Tilo Kranz, who is Commercial Space Transportation uh, Program Manager in ESA. We have, uh, or we are going to have, uh, likely, uh, Mark Boget, who is a CEO at Seraphim Capital, and uh, uh, Luca Rossettini, who is a CEO and co-founder of The Orbit, and uh, Eloic Perash, who is uh, a General Director, had been at HEC Paris. And uh, finally, uh, we are waiting for uh, Marwan Elfites, who is Head of Startup Programs in Stationet. Welcome to everybody. Uh, very happy to have uh, uh, you uh, around the table with me. I would like to start with uh, the first question to Geraldine. Uh, I'm trying to, to switch among you according to the to the answer you, you are performing. So be ready. <laughs> I will not follow the 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 the, 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 the sketch. So uh, Geraldine, how does a space innovation foster new market in uh, in your point of view? Uh, thank you, Donatella, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, I think it's it's quite interesting, especially today when we are waiting for uh, Jeff Bezos to lift off uh, for a first flight of uh, space tourism just one week after Branson, to, to think of where we come from. Space initially was a race for power, prestige, also for uh, demonstration of technology uh, capabilities, especially related to uh, military aspects and power aspects. But very quickly, actually, we shifted to uh, a commercial sector. And uh, for instance, you, you remember that when the geostationary orbit was invented, if such things can be invented, at least the concept was put forward, immediately uh, the interest and the commercial interest became very clear. It could be a place from where to relay data. Now, where are we today? We are in a world which is driven by data. We are in a, a knowledge society and we uh, create, exchange, uh, circulate uh, billions more times data than ever in the previous history of the world. And for that, clearly, space is irreplaceable. But beyond the obvious use of space for, uh, once again, data collection, data dissemination and transfer, there are indeed new markets which can be stimulated uh, in space by innovation. And I can give you a number of examples. Okay, there is the obvious uh, case of tourism, but I, I believe that beyond the example of tourism that we have today, there are very interesting possibilities offered by space innovation. Let's look at the energy issues, for instance. Uh, we, we know we use solar cells in space or fuel cells or even nuclear power for certain exploration missions. It is clear that all the innovation that we can achieve in space missions will be useful in solving terrestrial problems, whether it is uh, the technology of solar cells or even getting solar power from space. Uh, you know that there are ideas on how to install uh, large uh, solar captors uh, in space and uh, beam back <laughs> to speak the energy on Earth. So all these technologies are very interesting for solving terrestrial problems, but also for creating new markets. Uh, there are many other examples. Um, we can quote also uh, space for education, space for medicine, etc. The main point is to make sure that we, the space agencies, have a, a very open approach to innovation. And that's what we do. As you know, we have at ESA something called the OSIP, uh, Open Space Innovation Platform. And regularly, we make open calls for innovation and we try to assess the best ideas and, and give them a little funding to see how these ideas can be translated in, in concrete terms. And then, Taking it from there, our goal with the newly created Directorate for Commercialization, 
uh, industry and procurement, and in particular the commercialization department, is to see whether those very innovative ideas have indeed a commercial potential. So there we come in with uh, market analysis, we come in with potentially uh, funding uh, in support, because you know that good ideas need some, uh, let's say, financial support to grow and to demonstrate that they have a value. So we uh, can be, let's say, we can provide the link between the ID, the initial ID, to uh, the commercial perspective to this ID. So this is how, in my view, uh, space innovation can contribute to create new markets. Thank you very much, Geraldine. And uh, uh, leveraging on what you are saying about uh, innovation, uh, so technological and business innovation, I would like to, to, to ask the second question to, to Eloy uh, from the academic point of view. Can we state that in any industrial field, so we enlarge from space, uh, can, we, can we state that uh, this was innovation, both technology are at the core of any successful business? Uh, could you, uh, sorry, there is someone who is uh, talking in... Uh, in uh, yeah, Julia has to... Um, could you mute? Not Eloy, of course. All right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so clearly, we, we, you know, disruption is very important, and 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 of course, there are many situations where uh, you have uh, you have an important disruption. I, I don't think it's it is not necessary. You know, you the talent pool in a company can make a big difference. Uh, sometimes a a tiny difference on uh, on the quality of service can make a can make a big difference. Sometimes you. Uh, when you look in the in the digital world, you know you might have winner takes all situations. You can have a first move advantage in many industries. So, you know everything does not necessarily come with a, with the disruption. Now, coming back to what Geraldine just said, you know I'm a I'm an economist, uh, so and I'm not a specialist in space. I'm really sorry about this, but I'm trying to uh, to think about it in a in a very um, let's say economist way. And uh, there's something which I found fascinating. All the um, all the uh, the industry uh, and, and the business opportunities she mentions, whether it's power beaming, whether it's fuel vacuum manufacturing in space, whether it's uh, telecommunication, internet, whatever, they all have something in common, which is they all rely on the ability to launch. Uh, and uh, and when you look at this uh, over the years, I think again, she she. she I mean, Jody just said, you know, originally it was all about power, it all was about energy, it was about influence, about prestige. But, you know, 30 years ago, we were not talking about entrepreneurship at all, you know, of course, because uh, it, it was not, it was not the problem. Even six years ago, if I, my data are right, the cost of launching in space was about $8,000 a kilogram. Uh, and uh, and I've read recently that we're talking about putting it down to two dollars a kilogram in in five years time. So when you look at all those innovation Jardin was talking about, they all have in common that they need to be launched. And and uh, and again, if I look at it, it's that a big part of the cost for those industries, for those innovation, for those uh, startup. The launching part still represent a big part of the cost. So if that cost goes down a lot, that makes a huge difference. So going back to your question, Natalia, it's not necessarily a disruption on your own market. It could be a disruption on a very complementary market that can make a big difference. Because if clearly the cost goes down to two dollars a kilogram, then of course you know it totally changed the landscape uh, for many industries to be uh, to you know to. To, to, to innovate and to, to start thinking that there is an opportunity. So basically the risk adjusted return on investment is totally different. And then now you have a lot of potential innovation uh, on, on the market. So again, not necessarily on your own market, could be uh, on the complementary market, which is very important for you. Now there's one risk is that still the launching market is very close to a monopoly. 
you know, it's a pretty monopolist market. Uh, and, and clearly, again, an economist, when you look at this, there is a big risk of what we call an hold the problem, because an all the problem is a situation where you make specific investment uh, with the monopoly, and once the investment is done, the monopoly has uh, an incentive to renegotiate uh, the, the, the agreement. So generally what you have in those occasions is that you have underinvestment uh, on the complementary market. So for the future to have a lot of innovation, you need to make sure that you're going to stick with low prices, that you're going to have competition on this, uh, on this launching market, and the price will still go down. Uh, so this is one of the risks. Again, sustainability is also a big discussion. As you, had, I mean, as you just mentioned in the previous uh, in the previous um, uh, discussion, but uh, but that's you know the way I would uh, uh, as an economic part look at look at the look at the setting and the situation. Thank you very much, Loic. I would like to build on the example you put on the table and ask my following question to Tilo. Uh, Tilo, you are a commercial space transportation uh, um, program manager. And my question is, uh, is a aim at stimulating and supporting competitiveness uh, and new commercial European space transportation system? In fact, ESA provides co-funding and access to testing facilities to entrepreneurs. Could you tell us more about your program and how you are fostering uh, innovation in the space transportation market? Thank you very much, Donatella. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, join this workshop uh, this morning. And uh, as uh, we just heard from, from Eloic, uh, the access to space is actually one of the, the topics we are trying to really bring down uh, the, the cost, which is, uh, which is hard. I can confirm it's very hard. And I think we're still far away from uh, the figures that have been quoted by Eloic. I think uh, some orders of magnitude still but uh, we're working on it. And I think uh, one tool um, that we're employing is, in fact, the Boost program, um, which is, uh, I would say, a fairly new program. We just have been launching it early last year, uh, following a decision of the ESA Ministerial Council of 2019. And uh, we're putting forward also a new approach. So what we are looking for is indeed uh, private companies that are planning to offer new innovative and economically sustainable commercial space transportation services to end customers. Um, of course, we had been scouting the European uh, space transportation landscape before we have uh, been proposing this program to our member states to see if there is actually uh, a number of companies out there who would be qualifying and I can assure you there is a lot. So um, this is uh, what we have uh, been looking at when starting the program. And um, what is in it for ESA? Because uh, this is exactly the discussion that has been introduced by, by Geraldine and then picked up by Eloic. We're trying to look at new innovative programs that are actually doing some disruption in the market and uh, eventually what concerns access to space uh, offer the potential to lower the cost of access to space for European users and also worldwide users eventually. So in the Boost program, um, we are offering support in the form of co-funding, access to facilities and know-how to these entrepreneurs. But it's important to note that with this support we're not taking away the overall design authority or the full responsibility for the service projects from these companies both for the pre-commercial activities and the exploitation phase alike so in this sense we're advertising and, and we're implementing ESA is acting more like a partner with benefits rather than being a more classical customer of ESA procured activities so I think this is important to take away uh, from uh, my short intervention. Also, consequently, I mean, we are not issuing a statement of work as we normally do, but we have been uh, publishing an open call for proposals where we invite the companies to submit their service projects to ESA. Um, we would then check for eligibility 
And this is a two step approach and if eligibility is concerned on the basis of an outline service proposal submitted. We would then invite these companies to submit a full service proposal. And um, there are a number of uh, requirements and uh, constraints, for example, the, num uh, the, uh, the participating states to the program, they have to uh, send a letter of support for the activities. Uh, if you are more interested in uh, seeking support through the Boost program, I invite you to go under the web page in the internet under isa.int slash boost, and you're going to get all the information you are needing in addition to that. I give it back to <laughs> Donatella. You know, I have another question for you, a little bit yes. provocative question. So, uh, as we said, that the launcher heat industry is uh, facing challenges on how to move forward in this highly competitive market. I just mentioned that we are far from the figures that Eloic announced in terms of uh, uh, cost. Uh, could the commercial space transportation not be part of the solution? Well, I mean, for sure. Um, Everyone, uh, say that is offering uh, commercial launch services in Europe is automatically exposed to the competitive uh, space transportation environment. I would say at least the one of the Western Hemisphere. So, and we know, I mean, the competition is fierce, and uh, the companies, I mean, they know this as well. So, what we are actually seeing um, in our contracts with the uh, the economic operators that are looking to establish themselves on the field, um, they are trying their utmost to become as competitive and as efficient by employing new space uh, approaches to developing uh, the services and then also transition into a, say, a more regular uh, exploitation of these services. And actually, I can tell you, we are presently in, in contract with five uh, micro launcher companies preparing to offer new services uh, from Europe, from Europe, and we are uh, having the impression that they're doing a very good job in bringing forward innovation and bringing prices down. Maybe just uh, one side note I would like to take um, in the Boost program. We are not only looking at access to space, so the Boost program covers much more. Uh, also, for example, in orbit transportation and return from orbit um, transportation services. And uh, as I have uh, the, the, the floor right now, I would like to announce that uh, we have just been signing a new contract with the orbit in UK. And uh, it's my pleasure to have Luca in the panel. And we have been just releasing um, the, the announcement uh, to the press this morning. So we will be using um, uh, we will be supporting uh, the orbit in uh, deploying new services using the company's ION carrier uh, from the UK. And we have also associated uh, Portugal subcontractors, uh, which are looking to expand uh, into the, uh, the Azores spaceport. So this is a very nice uh, moment that I can announce this. And I know that Luca will also mention uh, what it means to the company. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tilo. Before uh, handing over to, to Luke, I would like to ask uh, another question to Geraldine because we are um, starting talking about the opportunities that ESA offers in, in, uh, in innovation, in business innovation, in commercial innovation. How is ESA steadily supporting the European entrepreneurs and startup companies competing to develop new Leo commercial solutions? Could you give us an overview, Geraldine? Um, yes, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say uh, we are supporting obviously entrepreneurs and startups, and I will say, but not only for the Leo commercial solutions. Uh, we are looking at the, let's say, the, the wide space economy in general, which includes indeed uh, the Leo economy, which is both access to space, but also space infrastructure. Uh, for instance, the commercialization on board the International Space Station. We also look, as you know, at the lunar economy or even Martian economy at a later stage, but already lunar economy has lots of promises. So how do we how do we support the ecosystem of entrepreneur and, and startup companies? Well, we, as you know, first of all, we have uh, uh, something which uh, we invented almost 20 years ago, which is called the, the, big, the big network. 
the business incubation centers network. We started with one business incubation center. We now have 22 business incubation centers, uh, one in each ESA member state. And even in, in several member states, we have more than one big, but we have a, a network of, of bigs in the country. And of course, uh, with, with that, we provide seed funding uh, for startups. But not only do we provide the seed funding, we also provide access to ESA expertise, competence. We have a, say, a number of hours of ESA engineers per year, which are uh, proposed to the startups. So we provide uh, advisory services, and we can also provide access to ESA facilities, because as you know, in many of the ESA centers, we have test facilities, uh, labs, etc. So all this makes a, uh, let's say makes an environment which is good for, for startups. Now, looking a bit further, uh, I think in, in Europe in general, in the space sector in Europe, uh, startups and, and uh, supporting startups is, is fairly well done. We have a number of tools to support startups. But what is the issue is more what happens next. How, I mean, how many startups will be able to grow? How can we scale up? How can we let's say, transform the startups into successful SMEs uh, with a, a sustainable business. And, and that, I think, is a big challenge for us to go beyond the startup stage. And for that, we see that there are, let's say, three uh, ingredients that are needed. Well, first of all, obviously, is the investment, not the investment for seed funding, but for scale up. So we need accelerator. And uh, I would like to say that we are uh, looking at the setting up of a partnership with the European Investment Bank and European Investment Fund, which will provide us access to a private VC. And uh, let's say we shall provide the, the technical assessment part and uh, they shall provide access to funding. So first thing is provide investment. Second thing, which I think is absolutely crucial, is um, in orbit demonstration, in orbit validation. Because once we have a good idea, a good concept, we need to demonstrate it, to validate it in orbit in the very harsh conditions of space. And there, we need regular opportunities. We are working on that. And I think we shall also uh, cooperate closely with the European Commission on that, because you know the European Commission has something called Cassini, an initiative to support the space ecosystem and uh, in orbit demonstration is one big uh, part of their Cassini initiative and it should be delegated to ESA. So it will be up to ESA to provide uh, this way to test a concept, an idea, a product, a technology in orbit. Finally, I would say there is a third point which is needed for ESA to support this uh, and it is perhaps the most difficult one because it is less uh, concrete. It is a change of the way we work, a change of the way we approach risk taking and innovation. It is true that ESA is a, is a space agency, uh, like there are many space agencies across the world, and we, are, we have succeeded with uh, putting together very large European cooperation projects, we, can, we have many success stories to share with you, and you know them. I mean, uh, I can quote uh, Rosetta and Philae, which was uh, really a very high time of, of ESA. We have all the family of European launchers, uh, as Tilo has mentioned. We have uh, the whole science program. We have Copernicus, environmental monitoring, which is really a leading program in uh, monitoring the Earth. But uh, to do that, we have used, of course, a, a way of working which is slightly adverse to risk taking because when you have such huge missions you don't want to fail and of course in the new space approach we are completely reversing the paradigm we are okay with taking risk we must accept that perhaps some of the ideas some of the projects will fail and this is how we will learn from as you know it's uh, fail early fail smart uh, we will learn from our failures. And it is a, a change of the way we work and, and it is something we have to take in house. Another thing we have also to 
completely change in the way we work if we want to be active in this new space spirit is the internal processes. Uh, all the project and program managers at ESA know that we have a very strong and solid way of implementing projects. So we have very detailed specifications, we have regular reviews, uh, we have standards, space standards, etc. Of course, the new space entrepreneur, they don't want to have to deliver tons of documentation. They don't want to have uh, uh, regular reviews. They want to uh, do a, a gate approach, kind of technological gate approach. They start, they develop something. If it, if it works, they continue. If it fails, they do something else, etc. So this is also a different way of working that we have to take in. And I think the internal transformation of visa will be key to uh, the success that we can bring to uh, promoting this new space approach. But the last thing I would like to say is that let us not forget where we come from and let us not forget who we are. That we support new space is essential and uh, it's my role to say it, uh, being in charge of, of the newly set up commercialization team, but it is also essential that we continue to do what we do well. So I think the two can coexist and I, I don't want to oppose old space and new space. It's just space. And there are different approaches to doing space. There is a more classical approach, which works beautifully for the very large European cooperative projects. And then there's new space approach, which works very, very well for more challenging, smaller projects, uh, you know. So it's there is no opposition there. There is a complementarity and we have to work on the both avenues. Thank you very much, Geraldine. You touched quite a lot of important points and I have a lot of questions for other, our guests. I would like now to ask, uh, uh, leveraging on what you said, Geraldine, on the startup uh, follow-up uh, growing, uh, I would like to ask my next question to Marwan Helpipes, uh, who is the uh, head of startup programs in Station F. Marwan, you are, uh, first of all, welcome. You are uh, an expert in managing pretty large number of uh, startup programs. What, in your uh, experience, determines uh, for you an healthy ecosystem for commercial growth? Hello, thanks for the question and sorry, I had some difficulties in challenge to join. Uh, well, great to be uh, to be here and to, and to share some, some experience on the, in that field. So, well, creating an ecosystem is exactly the, the, the whole purpose of such a place of Station F. Uh, I mean, we wanted to, to to gather many stakeholders under the same roof uh, to tackle some issues and some challenges some young startups face uh, every day. So, you know, one of the first pur purpose of, of uh, what we're building is to face, you know, the famous Death Valley when, you know, the first two years of, of a venture, the first two years of a company. Um, when you, I mean, you need to, to, to develop your prototype, you need to launch your prototype to the market and you need to find this famous product market fit, the PMF, uh, that is the, one of the biggest aim of all entrepreneurs. So this is what we try to address with Station F. Um, so in these two years, what we want to, to do, I mean, we want every entrepreneurs to be able to bench, to benchmark themselves against other startups. Uh, you need to, to be in uh, in an ecosystem where you can touch other entrepreneurs when you can see what they are building so you can compare yourself. Also, um, we are today in an era of uh, tech convergence, you know. Uh, you have so many startups, so many different domains, but they sometimes use and leverage the same techniques. They all leverage data, they all apply now some machine learning or AI techniques. So how can you push towards tech convergence. So, for example, at Station F, you have so 1,000 startups, all in different domains, B2C apps, software as a service, hardware startups, deep, deep tech startups. And what we want, we want them to influence each other. So we want them to learn from other techniques, from other startups. So the tech convergence aspect is, is really key. Uh, also, we want entrepreneurs to see and learn from entrepreneurs who, I would say, have two or three years uh, in advance, I mean, in terms of business, in terms of progress, and you can 
we want you when you're a young company we want you to start to stand alongside more mature startups you can learn and grow with them and also what is key in an ecosystem is to have diverse profiles so of course you all know what's happening in the startup ecosystem you always have the same profiles coming from the same with the same background so how can you mix business folks with engineering with developers and engineers how can you mix people who have no diplomas with people who are come from a fancy school, for example. So you need to have that in the same ecosystem. Otherwise, you will just produce the same folks, the same, uh, I would say, uh, startups. So, you know, what we do here, we, we're lucky to have 1,000 startups in 30 different programs. So we, if you want to come in such a place as Station F, you need to apply to a specific program. And every program we picked and we're lucky to work with, they, are, they all have their own expertise. So when you come here, it's like a small society. You see so many different people with so many different backgrounds. So if, if you want to face the first two years of your venture, you need to be in such a place. And then uh, you mentioned the word uh, ecosystem. So you, you need to have startups and then you need to integrate other stakeholders. So for example, states, I mean, uh, startups are cool. It's they're mainly private, but you need to have the support of, of, of states, of, of governments. So, for example, uh, just behind me, so I'm basically I'm today, I'm at Station F, we have the, the Office of the French Tech, which is the French uh, public initiative to support uh, entrepreneurs in the country. So they work here and they work uh, with entrepreneurs and they, they, what they do, they gather public services so they can work uh, with entrepreneurs and they can learn from the, the needs and challenges from, from entrepreneurs. Also, we we want to have uh, other stakeholders for investors, so VCs, venture capitals, angel investors, also to come to share their, ex their expectations and to see what they expect when when they 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 uh, fundraise, when they raise, uh, when they give funds. Sorry to to entrepreneurs. And I guess in the ecosystem, in the, in, in a healthy ecosystem, we also need to have uh, big groups, corporates. Uh, so in the 30 programs I mentioned, so we have a great school like HEC, like as you say, they have one of the best programs on site, but also we have corporates, uh, big names, so big tech companies, uh, but also non-tech companies. So when they come here, they know how to work uh, with startups, with entrepreneurs, and they are going to learn a lot. So that's, I mean, that's that's key because startups, they need to sell, they need to, to work uh, with big, big uh, corporates. So to me, a healthy ecosystem is when you have the combination of all of these domain startups, investors, schools, corporates, and you, you can see that uh, it's growing, it works well, but you need to have all these elements in your direction. Thank you, thank you, Marwa. You are, you are creating an open innovation system inside the system. Inside. Indeed, yeah. yeah inside the station F, it's it's pretty clear i would like thank you for for your intervention my my next question is it for uh, for luca so now i would like to have the point of view i do not know if i, I if i dare anymore to call you a, uh the orbita startup but you started you founded it a few, few years ago it was it has been a startup could you could you share with us what are the key influencing factor for a successful startup from creation to scale up, as you did. Yeah, thank you, Donatella. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation again. And well, yeah, so we started the Orbit in 2011. So when the word uh, new space was not even in the dictionary uh, at that time. So um, uh, it, it wasn't easy because when we start proposing our vision of, of space logistic, interplanetary transportation, sustainable space ecosystem, Basically, all of that was considered science fiction. So uh, what really worked for us was to uh, build a roadmap towards, the, towards our vision that was not really built on technology steps, but was built on market steps. So we tried to imagine which markets would enable the following market up to the, up to the vision, and then back again uh, to, to 2011, in which, you know, at that time, the market was pretty much only government driven. I mean, Leo was almost 
non-existing only for like, uh, um, like a few applications. There were commercial companies, especially in geostationary orbit, but it was still a, a market dominated by giants. So uh, when we divided in markets, we understood uh, which market uh, could enable the following market. Then we need to find a place to start. So what, what, what is the first market that you start from? And we decide to start from a niche market uh, uh, that actually have uh, like a, a, a big potential to becoming a disruptive market later on. And why a niche market? Because uh, uh, um, as I mentioned, you, you don't really want to compete with giants, especially if you are a company. So we started the orbit with one person inside, right? So then now we are 120, but at that time was was really hard. So, and the niche market allow you to develop products and service in a sort of protect environment because no one is there. So you can develop that technology and, uh, and, uh, and that market was space debris. Uh, because we we thought that uh, space debris could become uh, like the major threat for the entire space, the bottleneck for the further development of the space economy. In fact, it is now, um, and uh, and that allow us not only to develop like a real product, and uh, but also to use the same technology that we are still using today. So in a scalable way moving from market to market uh the next step was building satellites the next step is uh, what we have today building cargo that are able to transport satellites and technologies in space and then the same technology is what we will lead us to the next step of course we will need to add other layers of technologies we don't have robotics capabilities today but definitely this way of moving step by step is what really helped us to you know to like to survive in a moment in which space was not really even suitable for investors at, uh, um, at, at that time. So that's that's pretty much the the strategy that that we use. So that allow us to um, to stay resilient. Uh, and and I know that resilience now it's uh, it's an abused word, uh, but especially for European uh, companies, I think this is important. So we couldn't use the Silicon Valley model, even if we came from Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, you get a lot of money, you need to go straight forward to the point, and that's it. In Europe, you don't get a lot of money, but you have a diversity of other options. You can go faster using, leveraging other capabilities and other, other let's say, talents that, that we have here in Europe. And, and, uh, and being a resilient, a resilient company, so also diversifying the products and services, diversifying the revenue streams, uh, this, this is particularly helpful in a market that is not yet mature. So this is a developing market. So yes, it's growing exponentially, but as all the other markets in all the sectors that are not space in the past, they are sh that they were showing basically the same trend. You see that sometimes this exponential growth is fuzzy and you need to be prepared. So if you are a small company and you have to move fast, you need to navigate through these this market trends. So uh, diversification, uh, working both with, uh, as, as, uh, as was said before, not only with new space companies, but also with the giants, uh, that they have a lot to teach, a lot to transfer and institutions this is what help the companies navigate through and uh, well we are not a successful company in the sense that we accomplish only one percent of what we have in our vision so we are still fighting on, on the front line but definitely what we are doing today it, it, it is exactly what was considered science fiction at the beginning and the last uh, the last uh, let's say uh, ingredient uh, that i believe it's very important and i also believe in europe we have plenty of, of that uh, ingredients, it's talents. So a company is made of walls, machineries, and people. Walls and machineries don't, don't send in voices. So people is what really matters. Thank you very much, Luca. And uh, I have another question for you. How much do private actors uh, supported the evolution of your vision? In the last five years, you mentioned that at the very beginning, uh, private investors, private actors were not were not in the landscape. They were just institutions. But uh, now, now before 
I, and then I will have a question for Mark for sure. But before leaving the floor to Mark, I would like to have your point of view as an entrepreneur. Yeah, so, so when we came back from Silicon Valley in 2010, we, you know, we said, well, uh, I got some money from my previous companies, but it was not much. I had like 400,000 euro uh, and, you know, in space is really peanuts. Um, and so we started looking for investors and we thought, well, we are coming from Silicon Valley where there are a lot of investors. So let's, let's find some investors willing to put money in space. I mean, it, it was really a disaster. So I tried to pitch the company as a clean tech company, even a pharmaceutical company, because you need a lot of money at the beginning, patients capital, and then very high return at the end, right? So uh, semiconductor, even a biotech. I, I tried to pitch in the biotech events. So with, with really no, no chance. Uh, at the end, I found uh, two guys from a, uh, from a venture capital fund they were both uh, aerospace engineers and I was in the same room with them when they called uh, like a space expert at that time. So remember, it was 2011. Um, and I heard on the other side of the phone that the space expert was laughing. And they decided to put the money anyway. So they, they took a, big, a, a very big bet. And now I think they are very happy because the the return, the, the you know, theoretical return, of course, it's, 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 uh, it's definitely very interesting for them. So the point is, was, was, was really hard at the beginning. Then what happened is that not really the space market started, but the industrial markets on Earth went immediately all towards digitalization, Industry 4.0. They start using a lot of, you know, the, 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 the big data. Um, agriculture uh, became agri-tech, finance, fintech, uh, automotive, uh, automotive, autonomous driving. So all these uh, sectors start uh, making a, like a wide use of satellite data because satellite constellations represent the maximum scalability of the business because with one constellation you can serve the entire planet. So this definitely was well, one of the main drivers for companies seeing the opportunities and launching smaller satellites, also thanks to miniaturization, you know, all, all the technology advancement. And then immediately investors start understanding, oh, wow, that's, that's a huge opportunity there. And we were lucky enough because, uh, uh, you know, Europe was a little bit uh, not, uh, I mean, United States was definitely faster than, than Europe at that time. But in Europe, uh, I mean, we have Mark Boggett here, so he, he, he will tell the story probably late, later. But Seraphim uh, uh, was the first, is today the first uh, venture capital focus on space. So basically, they understand the sector, they understand the market, they see what is happening, they talk with all the companies at worldwide level. And, uh, and, and when they invested in the orbit, that definitely changed the equation for us. So uh, that allow us to move way faster, uh, go to market with the like customers, other investors approach us. So it was a sort of positive uh, spiral. And, uh, and, and I have to say that, you know, today is definitely easier than the past uh, for a space company to speak with investors uh, that understand the space market. On the other hand, we'd also need to take into consideration that more than 400 companies were created uh, in, in the last five to seven years. So also the, the competition increased. So uh, the requirements are a little, bit, a, a little bit higher. So you really need to have a go-to-market strategy. And just to reconnect with what was said before, you have to show that your technology is really you know, good and proven and that the customers are really willing to buy that. And that's, again, where institutions can make a difference today in this uh, transient phase in which the market is really going towards the commercial phase. Thank you very much. It's very clear. And now uh, I would like to ask, the, the, you, you mentioned uh, both uh, private and public institutions, but now my question goes to Mark Pocket, who is the CEO of Seraphim Capital. So uh, as Luca mentioned, we are in Front, in front of a growing commercial uh, market in space. Uh, so, and, uh, and uh, private investors are increasing, enabling innovation. We have an example here with us. How, Mark, how would you describe the current market from an investor point of view?
Mark, I think you are muted. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try again. So uh, thank you for inviting me along to the panel today. It's a pleasure to be here. This is the first panel that I've spoken at since uh, my organization, Seraphim, uh, IPO'd uh, last week. So um, uh, as, uh, as Luca kindly mentioned, we were the first space-focused venture fund. We're now the world's first space-focused listed investment fund. So we raised uh, $200 million uh, last week to invest into this market globally. And um, there's another $100 million of assets that are transferring into our fund. So it's a 300 million, sorry, 300 million euro um, fund altogether. So we're hoping that that's going to be impactful um, on, on the market. So let me, let me answer your question then. So um, how do I describe the current market from an investor's perspective? There's, a, there's only one way to really describe it right now, and that it's white hot. Now, that, that is, uh, that's both a good thing uh, and a bad thing. So um, what, why is it white hot? Well, the new space industry is really now demonstrating to investors that it's delivering against its long-term goals. So um, uh, taking sort of uh, the stuff that people read about in the newspapers, space flights arrived, SpaceX is taking crew to the ISS. You've got Richard Branson successfully opening up space tourism a couple of weeks ago after 17 years of effort and lots of false promises. It's finally arrived. Today, we've got Jeff Bezos taking himself into space. And again, he's talked about him creating a road into space through uh, Blue Origin. And collectively, that's what these um, entrepreneurs, these billionaires are doing and have done. And everyone's been reading about it for years. And today it's here. And this is the reason why the market's white hot. Also said against this, um, the, the satellite industry is also delivering against its goals. 2020, we saw nearly 1,300 satellites that are launched, more than any other year ever in the history of the space age. And yet in 2021, we're already only halfway through the year at 75% of what we did last year in a record year. So it's absolutely clear that we're going to have another record year this year. So all investors of every flavor are watching what's going on in this market. And um, they are becoming more and more interested as space starts to deliver against its promises. So, uh, so last year, um, we, we, Seraphim, my organization, runs a, a something called the Seraphim Space Index, a publication that describes um, all of the private investment into the space sector um, uh, domain globally. So up to the 31st of March, nearly $9 billion invested in, in the year to the 31st of March. Categories like launch, constellations, downlink, saw a 150% uplift um, during the last year. That's despite COVID and just incredible amount of new capital coming into this market. So there are, there are four things that are really driving this market. So first of all, is that the public investors have developed an appetite for new space or for space in general, but they've now got the tools to be able to access the market. So uh, in recent years, or most recently this year, ETFs are available. Um, these are, these are exchange traded funds. So they're effectively an index on the space market. Largely at the moment, they are focused around traditional space companies, but there are, uh, it's providing listed um, public investors with the ability to have an access to this market. So big names there are ARC Space Exploration or Procure Space ETF. So that's one way these investors can play the market now. This is the traditional IPO market that's still very much open. We've got great companies like um, MDA that have recently uh, joined the market in, in Canada. But of course, more recently, and um, specifically uh, of, of relevance to the new space market, we've got these um, blank check companies, the SPACs. These are the companies that have really been um, shining a light on the opportunity that's presented by the new space market. Planet, Inspire, and Arcit, AST, a whole range of, uh, of businesses that have uh, access capital through the public markets, but significant sums of money, 300, 400, 500 million dollars that they're now going to use in order to be able to build out their operations. So that's part number one. Part number two is that as a, they, there's a whole range of growth investors that actually saw this market as developing. They've really only been investing for the last couple of years, two, three, four years. 
Um, but they are not specialist investors, they're growth stage investors. And what's now happening is that those companies have been focused on investing in the most mature businesses in the market. So they had been invested in the previous rounds of Spire and AST and Planet. And now what they're seeing is that those companies are now accessing liquidity of the, of the listed markets. And this has allowed them to uh, have an even greater appetite for um, uh, exposure to the space market. They're able to see liquidity from their investment. They're able to see significant growth over a relatively short period of time because these companies are actually delivering against the promises that they've made to investors. So what this basically means is that in the last two years, we've entered into um, a time of the development of this market, the maturity of the space market, where growth scale capital is now available. And it's from growth stage investors, crossover investors, and now increasingly the public market investors. So what that's doing is that the venture community that have been investing into this sector for the last five or six years um, with, uh, with, with, with a higher degree of, um, uh, of pace, they're now starting to see great traction from their businesses. They're seeing the valuation uplift from the investments that they made earlier. This is now giving them the appetite to go and invest into more earlier stage businesses. They've got more conviction about space as an opportunity. So it's a, it, it, this is a, a positive a spiral that I think Luca talked about, where we've now actually got, for the first time, the entire steps that are required to fund a business from seed right the way through IPO and post-IPO, and that there's a massive amount of interest from investors in every stage of that. And now there is a significant number of companies that they can choose to invest in. So there's been a massive increase in the number of uh, companies. One of the things that's really interesting is that the number of companies that are getting funded each year has actually been very consistent. It's been about 300 companies per year that have been accessing private funding. But those companies have been accessing more and more funding as they go from the seed round to the A round to the B round, the C round, the D round, and now IPO. So the funding ladder for the space domain is here, and it's here right now. So we're going to see a lot more um, records being set during the course of the next year, during the course of the next two years. And now what's required is for the incumbent space companies to do what they said they're going to do. They have to meet their targets. They have to do the things that they've promised to investors. And if they continue to do so, this great environment of the finance being available is going to continue to be available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very exciting environment. My, my question now goes to institution, Geraldine. Uh, how is, uh, is uh, positioning uh, itself into this uh, uh, very uh, exciting new space ecosystem and these new national markets? Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank the previous speakers because it's, uh, it's really, and congratulations to Mark in particular, but also uh, Tilo made a, a very important announcement and, and it's true. It is a it is really a vibrant ecosystem here. Okay. Um, how are we positioning ourselves? Clearly, we are a, a public entity and a space agency. So we are we are not a startup. We are we we are there to provide support, uh, and to in a way it's a form of uh, uh, let's say uh, support to opening the road to space. I I very much like the I, I very much like the the wording from Jeff Bezos, uh, opening a road to space. And, and I would like to point out, by the way, that uh, it is funny to see that in parallel, uh, as he is going into space, he is also uh, creating this fund about climate change, which is uh, very well uh, funded. So um, I, I think those two dimensions also must not be forgotten. Space is both to explore, but also to, to work for us. So we are positioning ourselves in, I think, uh, uh, fostering uh, those companies which can be sustainable. This is, I think, in the end, what we are looking for. We are looking for, as I said, we have our business incubation network. Uh, we work, we will work increasingly with uh, entities such as EIB, EIF, but also VC funds. And uh, we are there to identify those companies which have a really good perspective for the future, but also 
for us, let's be a bit selfish, it is our interest at ESA to have new, uh, let's say, new companies with whom to work. We, you know, uh, it was mentioned before, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago when I was uh, uh, starting in space, uh, if you wanted to work in space, you had not much choice. I mean, you, you either went to the very big companies, uh, which are now the Airbus and TAS and Avio and so on, or you were going to uh, the, the space agencies or to labs. Now you, as a student, you can create a startup, you can be an entrepreneur, and, and all this is there to be uh, used. And uh, we are there to stimulate the innovation using these new companies. But also, as I said, making sure that they will be uh, integrated in the supply chain for space that we are using, we, the European Space Agency, are using for our program. And by the way, I, I was struck that the many times I've discussed with a, a number of, of startups or SMEs in space, what they are really interested beyond, of course, access to finance, is always a concern beyond IOD, IOV, is also grants, not grants, but contracts. They are not interested in being subsidized. They want to have, uh, let's say, contracts with ESA along a sustainable line. Because also having a contract from ESA for many SMEs or startups is a sign of quality. It's a kind of stamp. You work for the European Space Agency. Therefore, your, your product is good. And also it opens the door for you in the supply chain of the larger companies, and it opens the door for you not to be dependent on ESA contracts, but to also have access to commercial space uh, endeavors. So I think where we need to position ourselves is, as I said, provide access to finance, provide access to in orbit demonstration, in orbit validation, for sure, but also identify uh, which of these entities we will work with in the future and we will continue to sustain because we want them to grow and become really part of the supply chain of European space industry. Uh, once again, we are a space agency for R&D. So we are small. We are, I mean, compared to the Bezos and Musk and so on, we are we are relatively small. You know, we our budget yearly budget is in the order of 6.7, 6.8 billion euro. Okay, these are huge figures, but it's nothing compared to an Amazon or or, or SpaceX. So we we need to focus our action. We need to identify where to put our funding to the best use and. Um, but in general, I must say, it's a very exciting time to work in space. And uh, having started in an era without this new space challenge, uh, it really is, is extremely exciting to be living this period. And also it's very good for ESA to be challenged on a daily basis by what is happening around it. Thank you very much, Geraldine for uh, pointing out all these challenges, our uh, ADN and how we are moving from our ADN to a new ADN. My, my next question goes to, to Eloita. Uh, from an academic point of view, can entrepreneurship exist, really exist in big corporation and how can we leverage it? Well, that's um, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting point. Every time you, I talk to, uh, I talk to uh, you know CEOs of big companies, and mostly CEOs who founded the companies. So maybe they, they, you know this is a, a for Mark in the future. Uh, the, the thing is um, the uh, you know they all talk about processes and processes. And Jardin talked about it. So you know in ESA we have you know clear processes, and, and a lot of them are saying you know all those processes are just killing the company. Uh, you know the matricial structure is killing the company. Uh, and, and, and and it's even more the case again when the CEO was a founder and uh, and he's seen how the company evolved. So um, so the thing is, um, it's very interesting. So what we see um, even in a, in a business school, like I should say, uh, there is um, entrepreneurship is, is really growing at a, at a pace and 
you know, we couldn't imagine a couple of years ago. And it's very uh, fascinating to see that, you know, I don't know, audit was the big thing 25 years ago, and then it was finance, it was consulting, you know, and now a new trend is really about entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, and so what are we doing, which um, which is nice, is basically working on two foods. So we're trying to promote, I mean, we're helping a lot of startups. We cannot even face the demand. Uh, we have an issue facing the demand. I mean, I'd actually say we accept close to 5% of uh, you know the projects that come to our incubator, even though we need to have an HEC uh, in the I don't know in the founding team. So we need to grow. We need to go. Uh, we need to have more uh, facilities. But the second part of what we do is that, and we do that out, outside Station F, is that we are doing excavation. So basically, we're saying to the company, you have a project internally, uh, which you know, could grow and is it something you want to invest in. We propose to take it out of the company. Doesn't mean that you cannot go back to the company, but basically taking it out of the company and just we're going to help you grow as we do for our, you know, startups. So basically considering the project as a startup. Uh, and so, you know, you will mix with, uh, with, uh, with the young generation. You would, uh, you would connect with, um, I want talked about it with developers, with engineers, with business guys, with designers. Uh, basically, one of the things we're trying to do is, is, is to, to bring back entrepreneurship in the company. We first take out the project outside, manage them as a, as a startup, and eventually they will go back to the company and, uh, and try to grow. So this is one of the things we're trying to do that. And of course, what we have is that in a business school, we have executive education, and there is a lot of you know, a lot about agility, a lot about, uh, you know, trying to uh, learn from the lean approach and the entrepreneurship way to do things uh, in, in big corporation. But again, this is key. And, and one of the things which is key is that to attract talent in the future, company will have to change. Uh, as Jardine said, you know, the young generation, they don't necessarily want to come with the, the whole processes and the whole stuff. So one of the big issue today is that attractiveness from big, for big cooperation, uh, uh, you know, towards talents that, uh, that, that we have. So those guys might want to give a try and, and become entrepreneurs because their role models have changed. But again, if they realize that they could have a lot of freedom and, and act as an entrepreneur in the company, I think they could be very excited about going in the company because, you know, the money is there, they, they could have great projects. Uh, but the perception is that it, it's too slow, too processed, and, and not as creative and exciting as uh, they want it to be. So, uh, so that's a big challenge for the big corporation and the structures. Exactly. So, so you, you, if I may rephrase, and uh, you can build on it. Uh, young generation uh, are not. Uh, we, we are not making dream young generation with all our process and all the, the, the institutional stuff. So what makes them dream? Well, the thing is, um, uh, they, they have changed. They're changing a lot. This is what's fascinating when you work in a, in a school, right? Every year they are, they are 20 years old. So you get older, but you know, they're always the same age, but they have different expectations and, uh, and they change all the time. Uh, so, uh, so this is, uh, this is great. So today, clearly the role models have changed. They have changed a lot. And I think ISA would have a big role to play in trying to advertise for role models. Uh, I remember, I mean, don't tell you where you were. We, we did a, an ESA event on the campus and Thomas Pesquet was there. So again, I mean, Thomas is, you know, he's a, he's a superstar, but not necessarily an entrepreneur in space, right? He's, he's a spasional, right? So the thing is, he he, it's not let's say raw model in the sense we're thinking about it in, in the business school and uh, and, uh, and everything that has been said saying you know that the business is growing a lot. I think it's very important to show to this young generation what could be done and and, and successful people who uh, just created a company from nothing maybe at the time where it was very hard and uh, and, and now they see all the opportunity. So uh, again. I think the big shift is role models have changed. And the second one is that they, their risk aversion has, has gone down. 
Uh, and uh, so I don't know whether the private benefit of being entrepreneurs have, have gone up or the risk aversion has gone down, but basically they, they might have great opportunity to join big companies and they have an idea. 10 years ago, they would go for the company because they say, I cannot meet this opportunity, right? And now what they do is say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow my idea, or I'll give it a try. And I don't care if the company wants me, they want me in two years time. And companies, you know, like to hire people who fail because they learn something about you know, the failure. So, uh, so the risk aversion has gone down a lot. So students are really willing to um, to, to to do something. Now, I think at at, the, at this young age, you need to connect to uh, to identify to some people. You need to connect with uh, have, being aware of all the opportunities. And I think this is where a strike like as I could. Um, not necessarily always say we need to certify the innovation, we need to control what's going on in innovation, but just, you know, promote role models uh, and have them be very visible because it would give tons of ideas to the new generation who would like to jump in. Thank you very much, Loïca, for uh, this overview. So now we are we are facing uh, a challenge of being, uh, having a, uh, uh, an ADN, a classical ADN, which is risk adverse and uh, being confronted with, with new generation of talent who are not risk adverse. So, and we have to, to move into this, uh, into this field. My, my next question goes to Marwan, and it's a little bit related to this risk adverse uh, uh, positioning of ourselves. On your side, with your experience, what are the selection criteria, criteria you apply to a startup with this support? Clearly, you are not totally risk adverse. And <laughs> my second question is, uh, how do you measure? Because we have mentioned, uh, we have mentioned several times. So there is the momentum. There is an interest in space. Uh, there are investors that are willing to invest. But at the same time, uh, as Mark said, uh, we need the uh, so startup needs to to prove that they are able to do what they promise they are able to. do. So in your experience, what are the criteria you apply in the five, 10 years uh, life of a startup? When do you define it as a successful startup? Well, like Eloic uh, said, I mean, there's a high demand. So many people now want to launch their own company and just, of course, students, but also uh, any executives. I mean, if you take the average age, you can find that session app, it's between 30, 31 years old. So. Most of the, of the entrepreneurs we have on site, they already had a pre previous experience in, in, in a company. So, so we do selection, of course, and all the 30 programs we have on site, they do their own selection process. So all the programs run their own process, they are independent in that, but I mean, there are some common common aspects they all, they all apply. Um, first, we always look at, um, of course, the funding team. And, you know, we want them to be um, full time dedicated to the project. So if you want to come to one of the program at Session App, you need to be full time. So uh, if you only work for now on your project, just on weekends or uh, when just one day the week, well, it's not the good moment, not the good time to apply to one of the program here because you will not use the campus in the best way. So you need you need to be uh, dedicated full time. And so basically there are two two elements we look at. at uh, applications the team so funding team the background of the team their vision so what do they want to do um do they already have a prototype so uh session if you will find startups between the pre-seed phase to the series a the series a mainly so if you just come with an idea it's too early uh of, again you will not use the campus in the in the best way so just prove prove us that you already started to execute something uh could be a mock-up it could be something you can use anything but just prove that you went beyond the the, the idea phase um and then we look at uh, some elements regarding the business so the vision again uh, some kpi some early tractions uh and the roadmap so what do you want to achieve in the next quarter in the next semester uh, to see if session f and one of the program in session f can help uh, in that domain so you know we we're not risk i mean we we don't care about the risk because you know station f we don't plan to make any profits uh we want to have great stuff that's the only kpi and 
we are way in advance than VCs. So when we select startups, we are really early. Uh, in some programs, they come with just one or two people, with just a prototype. And we just want to see in the selection process if the funding team will be able to take feedbacks uh, from other entrepreneurs. That's the whole aspect of such a place to leverage collective intelligence. Can they take feedbacks and pivots and sometimes reboots of our project? Because uh, I, we, we made some, some some studies and 40% of the startups at session will pivot at least once during their uh, uh, presence on the campus. So. Selection process is key. They are all uh, run sometimes differently per program. But if you take the funders program, which is station at Inos program, we so we applied the criteria I just mentioned, and also we uh, requested the help of entrepreneurs. So on every round of selection, we uh, work with entrepreneurs on the pro bono basis. They have a huge track record and they assess some applications in the year. So because you want to have the point of view of entrepreneurs, sometimes of serial entrepreneurs, um, and it's really interesting to just to collect the feedbacks. And once the startup is selected, we share the feedbacks of uh, cellular entrepreneurs. Say, hey, this is what they said on your application. Maybe you should have a check on that and that and that uh, in the next in the next week. So selection selection process is really key, and it's a way also for us to see if they can, I mean, uh, navigate on the campus because it's I mean it's a huge place with so many so many programs and. I can mention other, other selection processes, for example, there is one key program on the campus called Entrepreneur First, what they do, it's a startup studio. So it's the only program at session that, do not, that does not select startups, but they select individuals. So we're going to select 80, 80 people per, per cohort. 50% uh, of them will have PhDs, 50% will have a business background. And in the first weeks, they need to, to form couples, so one PhD, one business. And after three months, after a quarter, they, they need to have an MVP, and then they, they pitch in front of uh, the program, and the program can decide to invest or not. So it's just one example. But basically, they select programs that they select early stage uh, projects. So this is the first element and selection process. It's fascinating because with such with the big volume we have on the campus, we have so many trends we can spot, and we see. Uh, uh, yeah, ideas and projects of the moment. So it's it's fascinating. Um, regarding uh, uh, success, how do we assess success for startups? So the first success is when they leave the campus, when they leave physically Station F and one of the program of Station F. So we want them we want them to leave. That's kind of weird, but we want them to leave in a good health, uh, with a bigger team, with great KPIs, with a purpose. Uh, once they leave physically the campus, and then they belong to, to the alumni community, but we want them to leave in a good health. So when you come on the campus, you just come for sometimes a semester, maximum to two years, and two years is the limit, and then you have to leave your seats to other, other young projects. But after five or 10 years, there are so many criteria we can have a look at. So for, for now, Station F is only four years. So we start, we have many KPIs, but of course we're going to look at the number of startups who um, which uh, did the fundraising. It's one element, it's not the only one, of course. Uh, we look at the revenues, obviously, but for example, just to give you an idea, every year, station of startups, they raise roughly 300 million. And there are tickets between 500K and 1 million, just to give you an idea. Um, so we look at the fundraising value and the number of operations. We look at, uh, of course, the number of people they employed. And just to 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 add on what Lucas said, so we we don't want to replicate uh, our ecosystem. So we we don't want to do a copycat of, of the Silicon Valley. So of course now we have many debates on the European scene on the startups ecosystem, on the number of unicorns, the number of decacorns we should have. So it's of course it's important, but now you have new concepts beyond the unicorn concept. You have, uh, for example, the term camel. We need to, we need to have camel startups. Uh, a Canvas startup is a startup that could be resilient. It could have another approach. I mean, resilient, cautious, committed, customer focus, which means they 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 look for the long term. And also, uh, the purpose aspect is key. And having a purpose driven ecosystem, uh, it's it's maybe the branding aspect of Europe. Uh, if you look at uh, last year in the French ecosystem, you 
you see, you, you, you were able to witness some big fundraising uh, among uh, purpose-driven startups. So now, if you look at the 16 to 17 startups, uh, unicorn startups in France, most of them are kind of purpose-driven. Uh, they are in health, they are in foods. Uh, so it's maybe the, one of the most important KPI, uh, see the impacts in terms of jobs, in terms of purpose. Thank you very much, Mara. Mark, my question now goes to you from your point of view. How far are private investments a precondition for market growth? So a precondition for let the, the startup leave a station at, for example. And uh, uh, what are the, the, the biggest challenge that you see in front of you with respect to that? You, you are muted, I think. Mark. Thank you. I'll try again. So, um, yeah, I think the activities that have just been outlined by Marwan there are, are really important. Um, so, uh, obviously, Station F is a, is a fabulous example of an ecosystem. Um, we've got our own um, ecosystem, the Seraphim um, Space Camp Accelerator. There's obviously other alternatives, Starburst, there's the Isabix. All of these things um, didn't really exist five years ago, but they're now maturing. And um, they're a place for corporates to be able to go to, to engage with startups. They're a, they're a place for venture funds and investors to go to. So everyone knows where to go to, to find the best startups. Um, again, drawing on what um, I've heard a number of times from, uh, from, from, from people, um, Luca was drawing on it. Um, it's about the people. So the thing that is required for market growth uh, going forward is, is about finding good quality people. So I think that ESA plays a really important part um, in this market where their focus is about supporting technology and finding the right uh, uh, the technology solutions to support. But then the, um, uh, the, the, the tech hubs um, like Station F, like um, Seraphim Space Camp, like the BICs are about working with the people that are then going to make these um, technologies into a success. And, and, and the key thing for success of those individuals, and we've heard it mentioned a number of times, is resilience, tenacity. And that is the thing that we look for when we're investing into companies. Um, people like um, uh, Luca, as soon as we met Luca, we were able to get a sense that failure is simply not an option for an entrepreneur like Luca. And um, as a private investor and uh, an investor in this market, what we are looking for are backing entrepreneurs that have this innate resilience, this tenacity to not accept no as an answer. Those are the ones that are going to be really successful. So out of our entire portfolio of all of the companies that we've invested into, how many companies in our portfolio have failed? None. We've got a zero failure rate. That's because we're out there looking for entrepreneurs with tenacity and the resilience to not take no for an answer. And they're like needles in the haystack. They're difficult to find. But, um, uh, and I'm not saying that this is something that only Seraphim's got, venture investors are honed to look for entrepreneurs that have got that resilience where they won't accept no for an answer. And I think this is the reason why these tech hubs are such an important part of the growth of this market. And indeed, actually, why ESA is, uh, gives uh, Europe an advantage over the rest of the world. ESA is supporting the technology development and the early stage risk elements of this market. You've got these tech hubs that are a focal point for supporting entrepreneurs, finding out which of the entrepreneurs will listen to feedback, helping this as a platform to identify the entrepreneurs that have got this resilience, and then investors like ourselves will then uh, invest into them. So. We, we've uh, got a portfolio of 20 companies, five of them are unicorns, none of them have failed. So, um, uh, uh, and these tech hubs are where us and other investors are searching for these, um, for these opportunities. So you ask where, where, where the big challenges are. I think, I think the big challenges I've, I've already really um, mentioned. So we've now got this fully functioning ecosystem for financing business. From, from, um, from private funding from seed and the, and the hubs right the way through to growth and then IPO and, and investment. And it's all linked together. 
So um, uh, what is absolutely required now are the companies that are the mature new space companies that have gone through these public listings. It, the onus is on them to make sure that they actually deliver against the ambition and the forecast that they've set. Because if they don't, that's going to actually have an impact on the appetite and um, uh, risk appetite for the rest of the market. So really, that is the, uh, that's the biggest challenge ahead, um, that um, the, um, the quoted investors are valuing these businesses correctly and that the first group of the um, new space companies that are mature enough to access the funding from the capital markets, that they actually then deliver against their promise. I, I, I believe that they will do. I believe that the companies that have gone on and accessed hundreds of millions of dollars have done so rightly and that they're actually going to take that money and really run with it and build out their operations and get to revenues, get to profit. And then that will, um, uh, will, will, will keep the market open for, for the rest of the market. But stock market investors are completely unforgiving. If the companies that have been accessing the funding through the market miss their targets, and, they, uh, and, and uh, the valuations are going to come, uh, come down, crushing down. That's something that I think is a, is a risk for this market. I personally don't think it's going to happen. Um, but that, for me, is, uh, is the biggest challenge that uh, is ahead. The companies that have taken the money from investors now need to deliver against the expectations that they've set. Thank you very much. Now I would like to, to, to go to two, two examples uh, with, uh, with Tilo and, uh, and Luca. Uh, Tilo, um, an example of the market. Uh, commercially focused uh, micro launchers uh, uh, technologies are now becoming uh, uh, a significant commercial and scientific opportunity in Europe. And uh, also thanks to visa supports uh, to, to this industry. Uh, in which way do you think that also in view of what has been said by Mark and by all the other speakers, uh, in which way do you think we could further develop a Leo uh, transportation opportunity in the medium term with a su success oriented and resilient system? Yes, indeed, uh, Donatella, we're coming from, a, I would say, very general considerations about the ecosystems now into a little bit of a, of a, of an application or an actual domain that uh, where we are uh, looking to support and to help companies uh, to come up with solutions and actually access new markets that are, uh, that are uh, arising and. Um, we, in fact, uh, believe that there are many business opportunities associated with an orbit transportation, as you have been uh, say mentioning. I mean, these are say going from uh, last mile services uh, uh, to in orbit servicing. I mean, we have been briefly uh, touching the topic in the in the first panel this morning. So there is a, a large number of technically challenging, but uh, probably promising uh, applications out there. Um, that would be enabled by uh, space transportation uh, services, right? I mean, if you want to do something somewhere, I mean, you will have to get there. This is important. And uh, although we know that, uh, say, the space transportation um, element of the overall value chain you can have in space is still uh, pretty small, but I would say it's an it's an, an, an a very important enabler for a lot of things. Um, and without you could not. Uh, materialize any of your business so what I'm, I'm the commercial space transportation manager running the boost program so of course i'm coming back uh, to this in, in a way so um we are of course uh, let's say encouraging uh, the new space actors um, to, to get in touch with us and we are um somewhere i mean we have been uh, discussing this a lot where uh, we are looking or focusing uh, in the uh, in the growth stage of these uh, businesses and what I can say in mean, the boost program, we're looking at a little bit more advanced stages. Normally, I mean, they should have come out of station F. They should have already uh, uh, raised a number of uh, funding rounds uh, in the private uh, sector, and uh, we're supporting them in the pre-commercial activities. So this is uh, where we are focusing. They, they should be somehow, uh, I would say, not too far away from uh, commercialization. And what I can say at this present moment, I mean, we are um, well, we're 
highly interested to see innovative proposals. We're not saying, uh, let's say at least in this program, we were not saying what should be the technical solution. I mean, we're we're looking at technical solutions that we get and uh, we evaluate them. And what I can say is we are looking also uh, to continue the program past the 2022 horizon and to offer even more opportunities for support for commercial operators. So I think this is a, a nice outlook and I hope uh, we get uh, the good ideas and the good projects uh, submitted. Thank you very much, Tilo. Luca, uh, you mentioned the or in your in your intervention that uh, your ambition and I and you feel yourself not successful because you are just uh, realizing one percent of uh, of what you are looking for. Uh, uh, in uh, in the ninety nine percent of what you are looking for, uh, you have a, uh, I would say uh, consolidating reality of several Leo uh, solutions. Do you foresee a shift? Towards uh, services in this in, in the future. Yeah. So, well, first of all, first of all, I'm very happy and and and, and proud of, of what the orbit has achieved so far. That is really amazing. If we think that the, the total amount of money that we raise is just a fraction of any other U.S. companies that are still pre-revenues and pre-products. So, so it, uh, you know, that's that's still to to be recognized. Um, and, and before answering your question, ju just a couple of comments um, based on some um, um, some interventions are very interesting. So, first of all, um, cost of launch. So we are focusing a lot on cost of launches, but if we look at the micro launches, they are not really driving down the cost of launch. Uh, and the cost of launch is not the aspect that we should focus on, but it's really I mean, the, ent the entirety of aspects that uh, are important for a satellite operator. So what does a satellite operator re really want? They want to sell information to their customers as fast as possible at the higher, a highest price at the, lower at the lowest cost. This is what they want. So it's not just the launch. It's uh, the way you get to orbit, the business model, how you deploy your constellation, how fast you are in uh, being ready to deploy uh, your satellites and having the, the, the data ready, how fast you are on processing data in the right way. So, you know, artificial intelligence and so on. So uh, this is, these are all part of, of, the, uh, of the aspects that need to take into consideration to get to the objective. Sometimes there are customers that are deliberately choosing a, a, a higher cost launcher because it provides higher reliability. And this is, you know, a very like good uh, aspect of European launches that we know they are expensive, but they are also very reliable. So everything should be taken into account, not just uh, one aspect. Otherwise, we risk every time to focus on, on one piece of the puzzle and, and to lose the, 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 what is the final objective. The second aspect uh, that I want to touch is that, so uh, thanks to the heritage that we matured working with ESA, and, uh, and also the other traditional companies, we were able to have uh, paying customers since the first cargo that we launched in space because they went through uh, the quality process that we use in, in the orbit. So I think, uh, well, uh, you know, it's, ESA is not just money for developing technology. It's really a, a brand that you can use and you can leverage to get faster uh, to market. So I think this is an important aspect. Um, so, uh, to come to your question, so first of all, the Orbit is an infrastructure provider, right? So, we, we focus on the space-to-space -space market. And for me, there is no difference in Orbit, LEO, MIO, GEO, or wherever you want to go in, uh, in, in space. The only difference is in, is in market readiness. So, uh, today, uh, the market although it's really directed towards a, a, a full commercial market, it, it's still uh, heavily supported by institutions. Uh, if we think about most of the end users uh, of space today are still institutions. And this is actually good because this stimulated the entrance of several commercial entities that actually today are buying from space. So, but we are still in a transient phase. The second uh, important aspect, I think that, um, 
uh, in order to enable this face-to-space -space market, you need to make sure that the entire ecosystem is really growing at, at the fast pace. So what Geraldine said, uh, making sure that go-to-market is achieved as fast as possible. So in orbit validation and demonstration, it's a very important example. What Tilo mentioned before, and by the way, that, that's amazing, very good news for today. And <laughs> so, so we signed the contract, so we are very happy to, to cooperate. That's, that's another example of how the, the private industry can cooperate with, with the public institutions to accelerate the market. Um, yeah, for example, I just got a video of another release of a satellite exactly where we are talking right now of a cargo that we are in orbit. So we usually reserve two to three slots uh, for uh, younger companies that need to test technology in orbit already, because we believe if they are successful, at least, uh, you know, a percentage of them will be definitely successful. They will come back to us and they will become like satellite operators using the orbit for, so it's a sort of investment for the future, but this can definitely be accelerated by institutions. We have literally, literally hundreds of requests for flying technology in orbit and not only for early stage companies or, or, or institutions also from traditional companies. So uh, there is really a lot of requests there. And, and, the, and the, the idea is not really to develop my cargo using ESA money. Is I already have a cargo. We launched three cargos in less than nine months. And, they are, and uh, all of them with uh, satellites and, uh, and, and let's say technologies to be tested. So uh, we want we want a partner, as, as you said before, we want a contract for service to help the ecosystem growing faster. And, um, and this is a part of building the infrastructure. Another important piece for the future evolution of what we are doing now, it's um, how we optimize the work of satellite operators. Uh, well, let, let's look at, at what the industry is doing on Earth. All the industries moved into the cloud so they, they, they didn't keep buying, you know, bigger computers uh, uh, for working better. At certain point, they shifted into edge computing, right? So why not in space? This is drastically changed the equation. This is completely changed the way satellite operators are going to design their business model. And today we have in orbit a data center that we are going to test to deploy uh, edge computing services to satellite operators as well. And we have uh, like a big partner, I cannot name it, it's, it's one of the well-known cloud uh, provider on earth that, uh, that they are interested on in expanding the cloud into orbit. And this is another important piece of the equation. Why I'm telling you that? Because if we really want to move into the in-orbit servicing, that is definitely where we are going, uh, you know, our cargo, we already tested all the maneuvers in orbit. Uh, we are working on all the proximity operations technology that we need to, to achieve and so on. But in order to get there, to, to have a real full commercial service, you don't need just the technology. You don't need just the robotic arm or the capability of grabbing a satellite. So to deliver a commercial service, so to make money out of that, you really need to make sure that you have your cost under control. And if you need uh, 10 people for each single mission uh, with thousands of satellites that you need to serve, this is not really working. So you need automation, intelligence, but you can have, you, you cannot have a lot of compu computational power just on one satellite. And that's why edge computing, that's why, you know, working in a cloud environment, that's why having a flexible transportation system, we believe this is going to be a competitive edge. And that's why we are working on that sense. And uh, apart from in-orbit servicing, everybody wants to work in the in-orbit servicing. If you look at every startup building motors, they are all saying we want to work in the in-orbit servicing. But this is not the end. Actually, this is the beginning. The in-orbit servicing, again, will be an enabling market for whatever will bring us into a real space-to-space -space economy, interplanetary transportation, uh, orbit manuf uh, orbital manufacturing, recycling in orbit. Because at the end, what we really want is a sustainable ecosystem in which the company can really make business we will not consider space as a space market, but we will divide it in verticals as we do on earth. 
And in order to get there, once again, the word sustainability, I think, is important. I like to say, instead of the word sustainability, I like to say future capable of future. This is something that in space we are not familiar with. Uh, we all know the issue of space debris, but very little has been done so far. And uh, all these services that we are implementing will not just enable the space economy from, uh, let's say, financial economic point of view, but is also uh, creating the instrument to transform what today is the major issue that we are facing in space, that is space debris, into the biggest opportunity. Thank you very much, Luca. I have one question for Mark. Luca was mentioning different elements that make a success business, uh, business model, uh, how to, to foster on uh, alternative technologies, how to create market by providing, uh, providing a free uh, ride for not healthy and young startup uh, to the first stages. But from the, uh, from the, Mm, from the investor point of view, so we, we are somehow talking about accessibility and creating market. From the investor point of view, uh, in which way you are aiming to um, at making access uh, to space affordable to all? You are muted. Uh, I'll, I'll get this right uh, eventually. <laughs> so um, we have only made um, one uh, investment in the uh, launch category, and uh, and that is Deorbit. Um, so we've talked about them quite a lot today. The company that's aiming, aiming to become the FedEx of space. So um, that that is really our our only play on this market. Otherwise, we've really been all the rest of our companies are focused around. Um, building a, a data um, infrastructure in the sky and serving different verticals with different forms of data communications, because that's where we believe the, the short term um, uh, opportunities are for commercialization of space. So uh, that's the way that we're making space um, uh, affordable um, by the space taxi route. What, one of the ways that, um, that we're also trying to help the market is by creating an ecosystem focused on the three star the uh, the seed stage, the pre A stage um, companies, which is uh, which is around um, our Space Camp Accelerator program, and uh, one of the things that um, that I think that we are looking to do going forwards is to try and um, through that program um, organise more um, in orbit demonstrations, make it easier and quicker for these uh, most deserving companies that have got the best management teams because. Ultimately, this is all about the strength of the management team. That's that's really what's going to drive success in this market. So when we find a company that's got an outstanding international management team, we want to remove all of the barriers that we can do to enable them to get their operation into space as quickly as humanly possible. Because these are the companies that are going to be able to raise money quickly, build out their infrastructure quickly. So um, there needs to be a lot of connectivity between those um, in the the launch industry that can provide this um, in orbit demonstration to those um, hubs of uh, uh, the tech hubs, the uh, the 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 uh, the ones that we've been talking about, the BICs, um, uh, and obviously uh, Marwan's organisation. Um, uh, uh, so that for me is uh, is the way that um, there's going to be a big impact here by getting the most capable entrepreneurs connected to those that can provide rapid access to space. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I have one question for, for Mauer. Uh, we have been talking about this uh, space of startup ecosystem so far, uh, but we see that in the overall value chain, uh, um, not only space is uh, valuable uh, as, a, as, a, as a service. In your view, how far uh, are your startup ecosystem ready to go to space? <laughs> It's a good point because you know it better than me. I mean, space tech and new space is such a large domain. I mean, you, when we mention space tech, you have satellite, you, we have data analytics, we have imagery, transports, logistics, and so on. Uh, well, we do see uh, a few of them uh, on the campus. 
you have some pure space tech startups, and then you have the ones that are using and exploiting uh, data from from satellites for commercial use on Earth. So, just to give you a few a few names and a few examples, I mean, we, for example, we have an alumni. Uh, it's Interstellar Labs, Interstellar Labs. So they what they do they um, they build and develop closed loops of habitats and biospheres um, that can recycle and re regenerate air, water, and food um, to support, uh, I would say, human life. So first, of course, on Earth, maybe one day in space. Um, so they are using and applying some, uh, I would say, um, space uh, space tech techniques and design uh, design some some pods. Um, that can, yeah, recycle and be, be autonomous. So uh, it's fantastic what they are doing. And now they, they, they left the campus a few few months ago. And then we have some, as I said, some startups that are using and exploiting um, uh, as space data uh, in different fields. So one that is really known, I guess, by uh, uh, ESA because it's a form of big members, it's called Data B Labs, uh, which has joined the campus. What, what they do, they provide solutions and experts on uh, complex image annotation in AI. So of course you have different usage, you have agriculture, but you also you have some uh, uh, geospatial usage. Um, I mean, if you take satellite Im imagery, they, they are now more and more enriched by meta informations. And of course you need to leverage these kind of tools to, to increase your Decision making process. And then we, I mean, we do see some startups that are exploiting this data for insurance purposes or for agriculture. So we see more and more startups using these data and some core uh, space tech startups like Interstellar Labs. Thank you very much, Wa. Now I we are uh, running late. I would like to, to leave some time to to the question for the question from the public. I, I just received them. There are a bunch of it. I, I don't think we, we will be able to go through all of it. I would like to, to start with the very first question because we have been talking about talent, how to motivate, uh, how to motivate young people. And uh, I have a very nice question. <laughs> Uh, for those who are still at school, how and where we we can reach you and communicate our ideas? So, uh, who wants to take this uh, this question? So, how how do uh, young entrepreneurs get in touch with you? What are the opportunities they are they have? Luca, so I'm, yeah, yes. I'll come. and Mark. Okay, I see. Well, this, for example, is an opportunity, right? So if, if they have the chance to see panels like that, in which you explain what you do, or you explain how the market is working, uh, definitely there are talents out there that uh, really, either they were already dreaming uh, about doing something in space, and maybe now they see that it's possible. They see the instruments that are available. Uh, they see there are already other companies that are following the same path. So this, this is a, definitely a good way to motivate uh, these people. And other, uh, other way we got in contact is really social networks. That a lot of contacts that we get. We, we establish a, what we call the De Orbit Academy. We have students from all over the world and now uh, they are applying to come and have like two weeks uh, experience, working experience in the orbit. And, and this is another way to stimulate the creation of other companies or maybe in the future, uh, new talents that can join the company. Thank you very much. Mark, you wanted to answer as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, so for, for those that have already got a fully developed plan about what they want to do in space, um, send us an email and um, send us your, uh, your, your, the outline of your plan and we're happy to talk. Um, we uh, we also uh, run a program um, for um, individuals that are still in education that um, are thinking about spinning out um, their organisation but haven't yet taken the steps to do so. so um, of our Space Camp Accelerator program, which we call the 
companies on each accelerator and we take positions through the fellowship. These are uh, most commonly individuals that are um, that have done PhDs and they've been working on some amazing technology solution and they, 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 they are thinking about spinning it out and we, we, we allow them to use our program, which is a three month program to get to understand everything that's involved with the entrepreneurial steps in order to raise money, engage with investors, to, uh, to get their pitch ready, to engage with corporate partners, to really understand what world might be like um, in the event that they decided to spin out. So we've been doing this um, every program, we've done seven programs to date, and some of the most successful um, elements of the program have actually been these um, fellowship um, uh, individuals that have gone on and um, subsequently um, spun out from university, rapidly accessed their funding, and have, have, have subsequently gone on to build out their businesses. So we really recognize the importance of, um, of, of, of providing a pathway for people who are currently still in education to in, improve the, in, increase the pace which they can get their solutions out and into the hands of customers. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I think one other question always from, from young people is uh, to Eloic, this one. Uh, Eloic, in your opinion, will Spict market bring a new approach in terms of education and skills consolidation in uh, interaction with academia? In other words, what, what is academia, uh, what is the role in, of academia in, uh, in this new ecosystem, how new entrepreneurs are formed? Well, I think, um, um, you know, we've been thinking, I mean, Luca talked a lot about you know, technology and market, and he said, you know, you need to identify the first market before going to the second market and third market. And, and of course, um, there's the whole connection today between, let's say, uh, business opportunities and and, uh, and and technology. So one of the things we're doing a lot is that uh, we're trying to have ecosystem where people work together. Um, at I should say, for example, we have very strong connections with the Ecole Polytechnique next door. Uh, and basically, we're trying to put engineers and business guy and designers and coder all together to come out with uh, with good ideas. So you need complementarity if you uh, if you want to have a, a great company uh, in the future. Now, at one other thing, the way I see the profile of our student is that they, they need to have a very strong backbone on, on business, but they need to speak many languages. And I think this is one other thing which is maybe new compared to years ago, is that you know, our students need to speak climate. They need to speak technology. They will interact a lot with people from different background and they need to be able to discuss. You know, they, they won't be as good engineer as the other one, of course, but at least they need to be, you know, they need to 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 know how to talk to them and understand what's going on. So years, some years ago, you know, there was a big trend saying everybody needs to learn Python because you know you need you need to learn how to code. And now it has expanded in many different directions. Um, we talk a lot about sustainability in the business school today. We have in the, you know we have scientific programs around climate. You need to know exactly what you're talking about, what's going on. So um, the way we train our students is much more multidisciplinary. Uh, and of course, in a business, we expect them to be doers. So this, the thing is, bring the things to the market uh, is, is something which is, uh, which is really important. So that will be the way we're trying to very quickly define and, and see some of the changes. Thank you very much. Uh, Eloi. So before, uh, well, since we are we are going to an, to the end, uh, I would like before um, thank you, thanking you again, uh, I, and uh, thanking also the, the the participant. I would like to give the floor to all of you to one take, key takeaway from this discussion today, and uh, to say bye bye. <laughs> Please. Who's first? Did I, I see Mark in my screen. I see Mark, so I go. I go according to the to. to... I will unmute myself this time before I start speaking. Um, so uh, yeah, I just uh, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur in the space market. So uh, investors at every stage of the investment.
uh, have drank the Kool-Aid. They believe in the story. So now, uh, if you are an entrepreneur in this market and you're looking to build a business, you know, focused on the things that we've just been talking about, you know, be tenacious and, uh, and avoid um, uh, talking about things that you don't understand because investors can smell bullshit a mile away and um, you just avoid using it. Thank you very much. I see Eloic on the screen. Thank you, Mark, for, for being with us today. Eloic, you are on mute. My turn now. Uh, the, um, again, I think we, um, when we really need raw models, uh, and, uh, you know, and every time people talk about the same ones, you know, the, you know, Elon is a big, uh, is a big raw model. Uh, you know, I think it's great for the industry globally. Uh, but, but the thing is, you know, it, it's very happy to listen to what Luca had to say today. And, and the thing is we need more and more raw models. And the more you have them connected with the young generation, the more it gives ideas. You know, I think a lot of our students, when they arrive in engineering school or business school, they have no idea why they're here. They have no idea about what's the future. You know, they're there to discover. So we need to connect them with very people from very different background, people from with very different projects to make sure that they will identify with one of them and say, that's what I want to do. And, and, and you know, they keep on investing. So. Generally, we start the first day by saying, what's your dream? There is a lot to dream about around space today. So as Mark just said, it's a perfect moment. And it, it's it's great to have people who can just come and talk to them uh, because uh, it would help them, you know, identify the dream and pursue the dream. So, uh, and when the eyes are shining, like, you know, Lucas' eyes are shining when he talks, uh, I think it's it, it, it brings the energy. So, um, so this is really important. Thank you very much, Eloic, and thank you for being for having been with us today. Uh, I see Luca on my screen. Okay, so uh, so first of all, what I want to say that uh, of course today the space market is still very small, right? So we we all work in a space market, but if you if you even if we consider the the, the 1.4 trillion dollar market that 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 we see forecasted in ten years. Is this small? But let's do remember that even if the Earth market is bigger, it is what it is. The space is infinite, so it, the space market can only grow. Every investment made today is in a market that can only grow by definition. So uh, definitely, if you want to join the like the cohort of space companies that are really going to change the way the humankind is is expanding in the universe, think big. Uh, uh, focus on uh, on uh, on problems and make sure that the problems can become opportunities, uh, and make sure that you have the right instrument to navigate through this market transition that 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 we are flowing on. And the last, as as I said at the beginning, I, I repeat at the end, talents. Talents are the key aspect. So people. Uh, will make a difference. The orbit will not exist without the people that we have in the company today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca, and thank you for uh, having been with us today. Uh, I see Mark. What? Yeah. Well, I would say just if I take my session I've had, so connect to 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 ecosystem. Uh, connect to uh, all the stakeholders we have around you. So it could be online communities, it could be uh, physical communities. So. Uh, just follow some programs, follow investors, um, follow uh, entrepreneurs. I mean, Luca is one of the role models you, you should all follow. So you should follow what they are going through, how they build their company, how they are building their companies, not just one or two uh, entrepreneurs we all know, but just follow the whole ecosystem. Space tech is such a, a large topic, a large uh, space. So you have so many different businesses you can follow. So. Uh, Luca is definitely one of them. Uh, we have um, the founder of Interstellar Lab from Station. I have also, she's someone unique also to to follow. So just follow Entrepreneur's Path, and you will get you you will get inspired. Thank you very much, Marwan, and thank you for having been with us. Today. Thanks. I see Tilo. Yes. So you're asking about key takeaways. So, I mean, I think we have been uh, addressing everything between uh, uh, what would be, I'd say, the educational uh, 
say background that we need. I mean, two, uh, what is the entrepreneurial spirit that we need? Uh, say the, uh, the the relevant um, uh, boundary conditions, and then I mean, growth and uh, exploitation phase, delivering what you have been promising, and and going to the IPO. And if I look at all this, I think um, ESA um, is a good partner in all of this because we have tools and measures. I think at all these different levels, uh, which help foster the community and uh, stimulate um, the innovation and the talents uh, that we are looking for in Europe. So I, at least from my point of view, I, I think we're, we're, we're doing well if we are engaging uh, more and more in this uh, uh, joint opportunity. Thank you very much, Tilo, and thank you for having been with us today. I see still uh, in uh, in line uh, Ferenc and uh, and uh, and Vincenzo. Uh, I uh, Ferenc, would you like to address our uh, last? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for <clears throat> being able to explore my messages here and giving some information about the uh, fast developing uh, emerging field of space chemistry. Uh, my uh, gain here was uh, very much, you see, to see the, uh, have a better view to the whole community and, uh, first of all, learning more about the, uh, that there is a, the, already a Space Cooperative Europe, SCE, uh, working possibly in Germany. That's I learned here from the <clears throat> uh, mass chat messages. You know, uh, I'm very happy to learn that there is uh, uh, investment corporations here in Europe. I would mention maybe that this year, only in the first quarter, $1.9 billion was invested into space corporations, mostly to pre-IPO corporations, but uh, a lot of um, uh, startups received money and we were uh, we were approached altogether by five U.S. corporations, well, partially or U.S. operations where we do have registered corporations in Florida, uh, get uh, inter uh, raised interest from uh, uh, local uh, capital, but it's, it looks like that in Europe also something starting. Uh, it's very important, you see, in the light of uh, the fast emergence of the space tourism. So space tourism will certainly uh, generate a secondary market. And actually, three years ago, we registered a, a startup under the name of Space Cosmetics, uh, based on our Russian connections, who were requesting some cosmetic products for alleviating the uh, daily problems of the day astronauts. So since that, there is some American interest for that, but uh, we do believe that this corporation, which is registered in Hungary and Budapest, should stay in, in Europe and not going to, to the States as so many other companies in the startup phase. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for having been with us uh, and for your intervention. Uh, Vincenzo. Yeah, actually, most if not all has been said. Uh, so let me just say that what we need to do, and I thanking you for uh, organizing this, is that we have to increase and increase and increase the dissemination of information. Uh, we have to make other people outside our circle aware of what we are doing. And I guess that events like this one uh, would definitely help uh, uh, the, the entire ecosystem uh, to work in the direction which was well described by the panelists before. And thanks for that. Thank you very much, Vincenzo, for having been with us and for your words. And uh, we, we come to an end. We have one minute. We are one minute late. Uh, my last uh, words goes to, again to thank you all for your participation. To those uh, to all the attendees uh, for your question. Unfortunately, we were not able to address all of them. 
at a big thank goes also to the co-organizer, those who have uh, made uh, it possible to be done. So I say bye bye to all of you and uh, see you in the next events. Bye everyone. Thank you today.